Welcome to the Women and Wealth podcast with Esther Sabo. Esther is a respected leader in the field of personal financial advice with over 25 years of experience. After going through her own significant and challenging life-changing events, she overcame fear and self-doubt to launch her own successful advisory firm. Now Esther is ready to share her practical and personal experiences to help other women clear their hurdles and brave life's transitions. In this way, she inspires women to lead fulfilling and confident lives. Hello and welcome to Women & Wealth with Esther Sabo from Gates Pass Advisors. Today, Esther has a great guest on the show and she's given me the honor of introducing him and that's Robert Mextroth. Robert has been a portfolio manager with City National Rockdale since 2011. In his role, he is responsible for investment strategy implementation, working with private client portfolios. Besides his MBA from UC Berkeley Haas School of Business, he holds the Chartered Financial Analyst designation and is a member of the CFA Institute. Robert is also a national champion bridge player. Esther, I'm assuming that's how you met on the tour, the bridge (laughs) tour. (laughs) Well, once again, you got to watch out for those assumptions, Eric. (laughs) Okay. Well, I'm learning. I'm learning. Well, you're more of a poker gal, right? (laughs) (laughs) Bridges is too slow. You know, it's funny the past really through COVID, my husband and I have played cards together and playing cards was one of my passions as like a five-year-old. Yes. Six year old, seven year old. And then somewhere along the way, it stopped being in, in my life. But since COVID, oh my goodness, we have a lot of fun with Uno and Rummy and some other things. So I actually <laughs> may not be too far off, but Bridge, I think, is a little more complicated. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well either Robert way, it's fun. Say. Yeah. And Robert can attest to that. So <laughs> why did you bring Robert on the show today? Well, Robert and I work together quite frequently, our firms do, in terms of implementing investment strategy for our client portfolios. And clients come in with questions about what's happening in the Mm -hmm. markets, what's going on. We've got this, oh goodness, the COVID Delta variant. What does that mean? And there's a lot of anxiety and uncertainty out there. And it's great sharing Robert's expertise. And so, Robert, I am just so glad that you're joining us today as well. So welcome. Really nice to have you here. Well, thanks so much for having me today. And let me know when you're ready for those bridge lessons, <laughs> free of charge anytime. It's a great oh. game and happy to help on the bridge front as well as the economic and investment discussion. <laughs> okay. One of my favorite words, Great. So I'm going to start out here just talking a little bit about how our firms work together, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a little bit different model, isn't it? From one traditionally thinks. It really is. I mean, that's one of the things I'll talk about it in a minute is that we do have a unique approach in how we work with clients. So uh, happy to have you introduce it and, and happy to speak on it. Yeah. So as our listeners know, so Gates Pass Advisors, we do uh, very customized financial planning for our clients. What that means is when I say customized financial planning, it means we don't just plop your information into a software package and spit out the results and say, oh, you look great or you don't look great. Here are some adjustments. We really spend time with our clients to really get into their heads. And I have a planner too, in terms of what are you really wanting to achieve here? What are the true constraints? What are the true opportunities? How do we bridge that gap? And then we keep the planning going as we implement the portfolio assets so they're in alignment with that plan throughout. And I've specifically set the firm up with planning as key because that is one of the things that I have seen keeps clients to remain invested throughout the very difficult times that I've walked through clients with from the the tech bubble bursting to the financial crisis to COVID and many blips all the way throughout. And we have different ways that we can invest portfolios. And one of them is utilizing the resources with City National Bank Rockdale. And Robert is one of the portfolio managers that we work with on the City National team. So we are ultimately responsible for how that portfolio, that it's in alignment with what the client wants and that their CNB is doing their job and Rockdale is doing its job. And then 
the client gets to have a live portfolio manager to talk with them and engage with them as well. So it makes a really strong connection on behalf of the client. Yeah, I think, you know, just to chime in on on what makes us unique is that City National Rockdale is a boutique investment manager. That is not unique. We do only work with clients that have a million or more in investable assets. But the unique approach is we really only work with clients that are coming to us through an independent financial advisor like yourself, Esther. And you just talked about what value you add on the planning side. The beauty of what we do is we focus 100% of our time and energy on the investment side. So by partnering with an advisor like you, who has such a good handle on a client's goals, objectives, financial situation, we're able to leverage all of that information and build out a customized strategy for each client. Just like you talked about on the financial planning side, there's a cookie cutter approach where you can just dump something into software and spit out a financial plan. The same thing goes on the investment side. Yeah, many firms out there will say, Hey, pick a number one to six, and that's the portfolio right. that you get. <laughs> and our okay. approach is just, you know, there's not just six different situations out there. Everyone's situation is unique. And by having a multiple advisor approach, meaning that you're on the financial planning side, we're focusing on the investment side. We really feel we've been able to deliver really good results for our clients over the years. And I think that's one of the reasons I've been with the firm for close to 11 years now is because this model has been very successful over this time. And a lot of portfolio managers in the firm like myself have been with the company a long time because of those outcomes. Yeah. So what we'll be talking about today is now that people know how we're connected, it's more about what is going on right now in the markets from your perspective. And because People do feel worried. That doesn't feel like a sense of security. As we know in the markets, there's often, or with personal finance, there's two primary emotions that can get kicked up. And one is fear, the other is greed, or we call that also fear of missing out. That's really another way that fear shows up is the, you know, I'm not going to get the returns that I think I should have. I'm going to jump in the market right now. But so many people, when they first come in and talk to us on our meetings, are like shaking their heads saying this just the markets can't keep going up what is is happening so robert you know let us know what your perspective is and that of rockdale in this current environment yeah it's a great time to talk because i'm seeing a lot of questions come in from clients that are more on the negative side when is the market going to start to drop when is the economy going to start to correct we're due for a bubble of some sorts and it's funny you mentioned human nature is to think all of those things and you don't see many people asking hey is now the right time to jump into the market and get more aggressive because the market's at all-time highs but Mm -hmm. When you really break things down, a lot of the uncertainty gets highlighted in the media with cases of COVID going up. Any move in the stock market now that's over 1% gets highlighted. But the fundamental core component of the US economy is consumer spending. 70% of our economic growth is just what US consumers spend. And that consumer spending is incredibly strong and healthy. And as long as that's the case, the economy is going to continue to grow and continue to recover and has recovered. So in general, the outlook for the US economy is pretty strong. And the reason stocks are near or at all-time highs is a lot to do with companies making a ton of money right now. Corporate profits are incredibly strong on top of that great run in consumer spending. So when those two things are aligned solid corporate profitability, good consumer spending, it's usually a good time to have exposure to stocks, to be invested into the markets, especially at a time when interest rates are as low as they are right now. Yeah. And that's another issue right? that comes up is about interest rates and what is happening in terms of interest rates and will they start going up and will that impact the market? Well, that's one of the most important questions out there that oftentimes most people don't think about how important low interest rates are to so many different things. Look no further than the housing market. Interest rates being as low as they are have been a huge boost to the housing market. And one of the reasons we think home prices are likely to stay elevated for a while is we think interest rates are going to remain low 
call it at least through the end of next year, the outlook for higher rates seems pretty unlikely. And the issue is it really is a problem for conservative investors. So investors that are used to saving money in very high quality assets like treasury bonds or even cash are starting to feel the real effects of this low interest rate environment. Because what we've seen, and I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit, is inflation. Inflation has gone up. We've seen a level of price increases that has been higher than anything we've seen in in a long time. And that's occurring at the same time where the 10-year treasury rate is still right around 1.3%. So with interest rates staying low, inflation potentially staying high for a little bit of time, it's a really painful experience if you have a lot of cash in the bank, if you have a lot of money invested in low risk, low interest paying assets, because the returns might not even cover inflation or haven't mm-hmm. covered inflation for the last year. And that is really hard. You know, Before we connected today to do this podcast, I was speaking with a client and we've worked together for over 20 years at this point. And it's been the challenge, right? Working with clients where we all kind of grew up in financial, you know, in our personal financial learning that, okay, as I get older, I move away from stocks and I move into bonds because we can lose money on the short term in the stock market. And I want security and what gives security is bonds, but it's not giving that income security, is it, to be invested in bonds to a great extent right now? Yeah. Well, I mean, clients of ours have heard us talk about this for the last couple of years that the traditional approach to retirement investing doesn't work right now. Because mm-hmm. the attrition, a traditional approach is what you just talked about is, hey, you put a lot of money in the, the traditional bonds. And it used to be you could lock in three, four, five, even 6% type interest rates with very, very low risk. And for many people, that was all that was needed to produce a stream of income in retirement. But now that the rates are so low, you just mentioned it, for many clients, that low rate of interest, one and a half, two 2%, is not going to cut it for retirement income, especially if people need this money to last 10, 20, 30 years and beyond. So a big part of our strategy right now is trying to answer this question. How do we invest for clients that might be low or moderate risk, but need more returns than come from those very low risk safe assets? And we see some opportunities in different areas of the market to do this. You don't necessarily have to make a trade-off between bonds and risky growth stocks. There's a lot of kind of middle ground assets that we look to, very high quality dividend paying companies, a really attractive area of the market right now. Companies that are not going to be as volatile as those that are high growth, low earnings companies. That's an attractive place to look, as well as different types of bonds that are more opportunistic in nature. So the traditional approach is lock it in with high quality corporate or government bonds because you know those companies and the US government is going to be good for the interest payments there. But one of the advantages of working with a firm like us is we have such a large research component of what we do. So that main question, how do we invest for people that need more income, but don't have the risk tolerance to go all into the equity markets? That's where we spend a ton of time and research energy looking for those opportunities and things like bank loan investments. Uh, Bank loans are a category of uh, bond-like investments that you can find three, four, five percent interest rates taking on a little more risk but using research that we have, you know, we're often able to look for certain bank loans, look for certain higher yielding bonds that they're certainly a lot riskier than what you'd get on the investment grade side, but traditionally are much less volatile than what you'd see in the stock market. Those are some examples of places we look. Yeah. And that is one of the things, you know, like with Gates Pass Advisors, we're never going to be a firm that has its own research department and does all of that down deep in look at things and research. So it's another way where it's a really nice compliment. So going in terms of the income, let's talk a little bit more about the inflation because one of the things that has been relatively helpful is over the past really 12 years that we've had such low interest rates that inflation has not really been an issue. And it's only really recently with emerging from COVID, if we can say that we are, that it's been headline grabbing news, right? Uh, 
you know, the highest level of inflation that we've seen in decades. So can you put that in perspective for us? What's going on there? And should we be really concerned? Yeah, and you're right about it making headlines for good reasons. I mean, we're seeing some big jumps in prices, but I see a lot of misleading analysis on top of those headlines. Uh, a lot of commentary I've seen, we're going back to the 70s, all the government spending is going to lead to hyperinflation. And that's where we would strongly disagree. There's a middle ground when it comes to the inflation outlook. And a lot of the inflation we're seeing right now is definitely temporary in nature. And what I mean by that is it's going to settle down at some point. It may be another 12, 18 months, but you have issues in the economy where there are supply chain disruptions, there are supply and demand imbalances. And those supply and demand imbalances, once they correct themselves in those sectors, prices are going to come down. And we've seen this play out in a few places already. Lumber prices is a great thing to look at. Lumber prices exploded higher. Lots of headlines about lumber prices a few months ago. And what's happened since? Uh, lumber prices have come crashing back down pretty quickly. They're still a little elevated from where they were before the pandemic started, but nowhere near their peak highs there. And what happened in the lumber markets is it's all about the supply increasing. There was a shortage of lumber all the sawmills out there, when prices go up, are, are scrambling to increase production, get as much supply out there to take advantage of the higher prices. And then once that supply comes up, demand is already there and price comes back down. You know, you're going to see that same story play out in other areas. You're going to see it play out in cars, where the, the auto industry has seen some of the highest levels of inflation in the last year. And you've probably seen headlines that say there's a major chip shortage out there and auto manufacturers are cutting production. Saw Toyota cut production by 40%. GM closed a few plants and still have them closed. BMW told some workers to take extra vacation through the summer because they're not going to be producing at the level. There's a worldwide chip shortage and car manufacturers are forced to cut production at a time when demand for vehicles has actually been much higher than it's been in a while. So that's the true supply demand imbalance. Demand went up for cars at the same time when supply is going down. That forces price up temporarily. So you're seeing 4%, 5% year over year jumps in prices across the board. But a lot of that is fueled by these temporary increases like you see in cars. Same thing in things like custom furniture and refrigerators. And it's, it's still like impossible to get a hot tub delivered to your house, which is just incredible to think about. You got to wait six plus months for a discretionary purchase like a hot tub. Mm -hmm. But there are just major supply chain imbalances that are not going to correct themselves overnight. So a bit of a long answer, but it's one of the more important topics out there that inflation is higher. It's going to probably be higher over the next five years than it was over the last 20. Esther, you said it right. I mean, we've had basically so little inflation over the last 15, 20 years. It hasn't been an issue at all. But even if inflation comes down and settles, Say it settles in the two, two and a half percent range, but interest rates remain where they are now. Even with much lower inflation, you still could be losing purchasing power year in, year out if we have sustained two to two and a half percent inflation over time. So, are you saying then that there's no place for just the traditional bonds in a portfolio? That's a good point because there still is a place for those bonds. It just, again, depends on the risk level of certain investors. That's really the place to go still for protection. So if you have money to invest that you need confidence that it's going to hold up over time, that still can be an option. I mean, it still can be better than cash in the bank that's not paying anything to get one and a half, two percent on some high quality bonds. But for sure, you want to have less invested in those traditional assets that you might mm -hmm. do in a normal period. So I'll go back to that example I mentioned about the traditional approach to retirement and make a simple one where, hey, you had a portfolio that might be 50% stocks and 50% bonds for a retired client five years ago. And those 50% bonds are all in investment grade, high quality bonds. 
Well, it doesn't mean now you need to have a portfolio that's 100% stocks, but that client that might have been 50% stocks, 50% bonds five years ago, maybe now is 60% stocks with a lot of dividend stocks, 40% in bonds, but maybe that 40% in bonds, half of those bonds are opportunistic type bonds that are looking for those higher interest rates, taking on a little more risk, and maybe you still have 20% in those traditional bonds as the safety net. So that's an example of you know, you're reducing your exposure for many clients, but not necessarily eliminating it for someone in retirement. Right. So you're keeping it like a safety net type of asset, not expecting to have much return from it, but as a protection layer. Exactly. When you look at the whole portfolio as a combined entity, now your return expectations for the whole portfolio are significantly above inflation. For a client that needs an income stream, those bonds are still paying and in, making interest payments. You're still collecting dividends and interest. And that's what we're looking to do in portfolios right now is basically just say, hey, you want to change the approach to investing based on how the world looks. I mean, I see a lot of mistakes being made in that an investment manager might have the same exact approach to investing now as they did four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. But that just doesn't work because the world has changed so much. All of the central bank activity that's taken place. I get this question a ton, which is, what is the downside of all the government intervention, all of the printing of money, all of the stimulus, all of the central bank activity across the world? Many people think, that it's going to result in like the devaluation of the dollar and hyperinflation. No, I don't think that's likely to happen. But what is the case is it's punished conservative investors because all of that activity has pushed interest rates down so much. So you have to, as an investor, react to how this easy money policy, how this aggressive policy has changed the investment game and adjust portfolios accordingly. And, and I'm sure that what we have in portfolios now might need to be adjusted two years, three years, four years from now. And that's just one of our philosophical approaches to investing is we don't want to just have a static allocation and never change it. We are a tactical manager that we're not trying to time every market correction, but we're trying to time major economic cycles and position clients within their risk profiles to be positioned to maximize their return given their level of risk. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons that we became connected because as I had investing for the clients, whether or not the economic environment absolutely shifting, as well as clients' needs are shifting, as we can't invest for them necessarily as we did 2010 to 2020, just because their life situation has changed. They're moving into the need for more income at the same time that we have this interest rate environment. And at the same time, we may be facing or likely to be facing increased personal taxation because of all the support that the government has given and needing to pay for that. So when you talk about being a tactical manager, this is something that comes up quite frequently for those who are considering our services respectfully, jointly, et cetera. It's like, well, you know, I've done well just being passively invested using ETFs and a very general model that is inexpensive. So why should I go to a managed type of situation and pay higher fees? Well, how does that really benefit me? And how do you respond to that, Robert? Yeah, it's a great question. And active investing is not necessarily right for everyone, just like passive investing shouldn't be right for everyone. So if you're a, a young individual who says, hey, I don't need these funds for 20 plus years. I'm comfortable with 100% stock market exposure. It's going to be tough to do better than putting it in an S&P 500 index fund with no fee and letting it run for 20 years. That's absolutely likely to be an optimal strategy for someone like that. But when you're someone who's worked their whole career and headed into retirement and facing the prospect of living off of their portfolio for the next 20 plus years after being used to having income for 30, 40 years. Passive investing is often not the approach that works for clients for a few different reasons. One is it's not necessarily comfortable to have full stock market exposure 
investing in passive investments like the S&P 500. Like, for example, last year in the pandemic, those assets would be dropping 30% in value. Not very comfortable riding through that for many people who are now not earning income in retirement. So that's one reason. But another reason is is adjusting for the climate that we're in. So just because certain passive strategies may have been very effective for the last decade does not mean they're going to be effective for the next decade or as effective as as some active approaches. And I'll tell you, one of the topics that we've been talking about is is one of the the most important ones, which is the bond exposure. Mm -hmm. So a passive retirement strategy might be, hey, 60% in the S&P 500 index 40% in a passive bond index. And the S&P 500 index, that could be all good and work out well. The problem becomes that 40% you put in a traditional bond index. And why is that a problem? One is just the low interest rates we talked about. Many of those investment grade passive funds are just not producing enough income or returns to beat inflation. But they're also exposing people to risks they don't quite realize in that when you're investing passively in bonds, those bond funds have objectives. The ETFs have objectives that they have to keep their average maturities at certain levels. They will be actively managing those passive funds to maintain exposure to a benchmark. We typically will own individual bonds for clients that we work with that have a million or more. And the nice thing about owning individual bonds is you can build bonds that have specific maturity dates and hold them to maturity. So even if interest rates go up and bond values decline, if you hold your bonds to maturity, you know you're getting your principal back. Not necessarily true when you're holding passive products. And the other thing about the passive bond investing, I talked about looking for opportunities on the bond side, looking at bank loans, looking at emerging market bonds, looking at CLOs, looking at high yield US bonds, all of these places where there's opportunity out there. Now, when you look at passive strategies in those opportunistic areas, they're no longer low fee. The more exotic you get on the investing side, the higher the the fees are on the traditional passive products. Like your lowest cost high yield bond funds are typically in the 0.5% range. So you're not looking at like an S&P 500 fund Mm -hmm. that's close to zero. So when you add that together, then fees start adding up on the passive products. So I think our big advantage, you know, summing this all up is in this future decade ahead, We're looking at low interest rates. We're looking at potential trouble for certain passive strategies. And we're not necessarily looking at low fees in some of the places that we like as far as the passive components. Yeah. And it's just, those are such critical issues as we're circling to generating income from portfolios. And the passive bond, as you said, you can't do too much within a passive bond ETF that doesn't give you the flexibility that you need or the ability, as you said, to look at other areas, opportunistic bonds, global bonds, et cetera. And although those types of ETFs exist, it doesn't let you really cherry pick in there the ones that really provide the additional value because you need to save every penny that you can (laughs) to be able to receive that yield that you need and screen out ones that just don't contribute that much. The other piece that we haven't talked about too much yet, and we'll just close on this, is how important saving taxes is. Saving that cash from paying out in taxes, which is a lot more difficult in terms of structuring a portfolio with passive investments than it is with directly held investments. Yeah. I mean, that's such an important point. I mean, the longer you invest, the more important keeping taxes low to keep those returns compounding is. And that's one of the nice things about our approach and that we customize these portfolios is that we can really take an active approach in the tax management. We call it active tax management because we can take a number of actions by you know, putting certain assets in retirement accounts to defer taxes by using very tax favorable municipal bond uh, type investments to generate federally tax exempt income. 
to having taxable realized gain budgets in client accounts to make sure that the realized gains stay within certain levels are all things we do to make our portfolios as tax efficient as possible. And again, I see many other managers just not having the time available or the resources available to do this for all clients. And you're definitely, if you're paying too much in taxes, not only are you lowering your returns for the given year, but you're lowering your ability for your money to compound over time in general. So we think this can add a significant amount of performance, just being very tight on your tax management. We've done some research that shows it can run almost a a percent a year in additional returns from being cognizant of taxes for someone in one of the higher tax brackets. Yep. And you compound that over time. And then the Vanguard study that shows you can have uh, additional two and a half to three percent for just having a team in place with you. It just can really add up. So thank you so much, Robert, for everything that you've talked about today. As I say with just about every guest, we could talk for at least an hour longer, but we will close it here. And if people wanted to learn more about you or about City National Bank's Rockdale's process, where would they go? Yeah. I mean, we put a lot of our economic information right on our website at cnr.com, cnr.com. You can click on insights and you'll see our monthly updated economic information posted there. So definitely check our website out. And if you'd want to know more about how you can work with us and through us work with Robert and City National Rockdale, you can find more out about us on gatespassadvisors.com. And we'd be happy to talk with you about whatever is on your mind and concerns. Always happy to share. Robert, thank you again so much for joining us today. It's been wonderful to have you. Always a pleasure, Esther. Thanks for having me again. I'm just going to echo what Esther said, Robert. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Nice meeting you and, and nice getting to know you as far as what you do. And obviously, you're very passionate about what you do for your clients. And working with Esther, I know there's a mutual passion there for all the clients. Mm -hmm. So thank you for being on the show. And of course, Esther, thank you so much for bringing him on the show and providing this education to your audience. I know that they appreciate it. I learn something new every time. And so I certainly appreciate it. But our last thank you always goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Women in Wealth podcast with Esther Saba. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Esther comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thanks so much for listening today. For everyone at Gates Pass Advisors, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Women and Wealth Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you receive notifications of new podcasts as they become available. Check out the website at www.gatespassadvisors.com for more information. This content is developed from sources believed to be providing accurate information. The information in this material is not intended as tax or legal advice. Please consult legal or tax professionals for specific information regarding your individual situation. The opinions expressed and material provided are for general information and should not be considered a solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security.